This is the word of God. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many words, many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Um, Acts uh, from chapter 1 and the following, we have... Uh, the description of the beginning of the New Testament church. New Testament church. Uh, I say a New Testament church because there's such a thing as the Old Testament church. Uh, Old Testament church was very peculiar. I mean, it was mainly made up of one particular ethnic group, um, nation of Israel, and the children of Jacob uh, and descendants of him even though uh, there were occasional introductions of non-Israelites into that community by conversion. The Old Testament church was mainly of that people, and uh, that particular church, by the definition, church means people that are called out to worship God, and that congregation was first formally introduced in the Old Testament in that time in the wilderness when they stood at the Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God called them as his covenant people. So that's where the first worship of a sort of the community uh, a congregational worship is sort of formally introduced to us. That's the Old Testament church. Something about the Old Testament church. Old Testament church is an expecting church. It's a church that's waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. It is a church that's waiting for the deliverer to come. They have not yet had the deliverer that will bring them to the ultimate home. Okay? They are still waiting for the Messiah or the King to lead them. Moses was a great uh, uh, picture of what that leader looks like, but Moses was not the one who brought them into the land of Canaan. Remember that? And Moses said, you have to wait until someone comes among the brothers who may be like me. Listen to him. And that wasn't Joshua. So they were still waiting for the Messiah to come. So the Old Testament church is a prophetic church that waited for the coming of the Messiah, the anointed king. New Testament church that begins in book of Acts, is different. It's not no longer a church that's expecting, but a church that's proclaiming the fulfillment. It's the church that says, yes, there was that Messiah that everybody expected, right? If you kind of read uh, Peter's sermon in chapter 2 or chapter 3, you will see that he's talking a lot about the Old Testament references, all the stuff that the Old Testament prophets had said, including King David, all those things are fulfilled in this man, Nazareth, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, 
and He is the Messiah. How do we know that He's the Messiah? Well, because He performed all these signs. Signs. Signs are like pointers, right? Signs are not the reality. They are the pointers to the reality. So, signs are not as important as who Jesus really is. But the signs were signs that Jesus really is the deliverer. He was the king who came to save the people from their sins. How did they know that Jesus is the deliverer? That Jesus is the Messiah? Because Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered as the righteous servant. They've seen Jesus. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. Jesus was fully righteous, but he suffered as an innocent sufferer. And that was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, for example. Suffering servant. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Why? Because he was resurrected. Jesus died, he suffered and died, but he didn't remain in the tomb. But this Jesus was raised from the dead. And these 120 people we find in chapter 1 of the book of Acts were coming together to pray in this first church building. It was the upper room of a very prominent woman in Jerusalem, a large upper room. But this was the church, first church building. It was like a meeting house. And there they met together, and all these people had one thing in common. That is, they've seen the resurrected Jesus. And they all claimed together that Jesus is that Messiah. And this Jesus was ascended into the heavenly place, and he's in glory. And when Jesus returns as the king who shall judge the whole world, what will happen? Well, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. you got to call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. He is the one who gives, grants forgiveness. He is the ground for which we have forgiveness because He shed His own precious blood for us. He is the victory over death. We're no longer slaves to death. We're no longer fearful of it to think that death is the final destruction. No, we say, well, death is the destruction to this world, but in fact, it is an entrance into the real world. No longer we are afraid. Why? Because the resurrection life waits us in time to come. So all these things announce the coming of the New Testament church. So in the first chapter of Book of Acts, again, there's 11 apostles. So, okay, one apostle, Judas Iscariot, uh, was taken out. He actually um, kills himself out of guilt after he sold Jesus. And 11 apostles met together, and they said, well, we got to add one to make it 12. And you might wonder, why? Why is it necessary? Isn't 11 enough? There's so many others, too. Uh, the reason being is that uh, Peter, who spoke this way, that we need to add an extra uh, 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 apostle to make it 12. He fully understood that what they represented was a New Testament church. It's a community thing. It's the people of God. Just like the Old Testament church had 12 tribes, 12 sons of Israel, we need 12 apostles to be the foundational stones for this church. So he knew. So he was thinking not about himself. He was thinking about what this all meant historically. So they added Matthias at the end, right? So there's 12 apostles, but along with them, there are 120 people in all who have dedicated themselves to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. It says they were all in one heart, and they only focused on prayer. They were prayerfully waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. That's how the first New Testament church begins. That's what it looks like. And then in chapter 2, coming of the Holy Spirit, the grand day, the day of Pentecost. By the way, the Pentecost didn't start in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost was one of the three major, major festivals for the Jewish people. And every major festival, Jewish men had to represent their household and come to Jerusalem and be part of a communal festival, right? Right? So, uh, uh, Pentecost had something to do with the harvest. It's the, it's the time of, of, of giving thanks 
the, 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 the harvest. So uh, it, that's, that's, that's what the Pentecost was about. The other was Passover earlier. And, and then uh, there is the, the other day called a, a Feast of Booth. Uh, that happens a little later in the, in the early winter. So you had three, these ma three major festivals. And, and Pentecost was something about the harvest. And that's when, um, when people were gathered from everywhere right? It, it actually talks about people coming from not only all parts of what is now called Palestine, but they, they came from all parts of the known world because there were Jewish diaspora everywhere, right? So they came to celebrate the day of Pentecost. And on that day, on that day, Holy Spirit came as promised. He came to fill the church, we're not talking about the building, even though there's a bit of a description of, of that kind of spacious coming of the Spirit, like a tongues, plural, tongues of fire. A lot of people focus on the fire part, thinking that Holy Spirit's like fire. Well, it's, it's true in a sense that, that, that there's that, that kind of fiery purging that's involved, but the focus here is the tongue. Tongues of fire rested on all 120 who were praying. Day of Pentecost. And then they go outside the building, and what do they do? They boldly proclaim that Jesus is the Lord. He's the resurrected Lord. An amazing thing happens, right? People who are listening to what they're saying say to amongst themselves, Aren't they all from Galilee, practically? Aren't, aren't they Galileans? Aren't, aren't they like the, the peasants from that, that kind of up there, the fishing town? Aren't, aren't, aren't they people that are really uneducated? But look, listen to them. They are speaking in the languages that we understand. Meaning what? All these people who came from all corners of the known world then were hearing them speak their language. Right? So all kinds of languages were being spoken by them. This was the great Pentecost sign. Um, let, me, let me just say a few words about the significance of Pentecost uh, uh, sign or that day of Pentecost. Well, first, let me say, I already said it, so let me say, Pentecost was associated with harvest. So why did the Holy Spirit come on the day of Pentecost? Well, it's, it's sort of all, all matches. Jesus died around Passover as a Passover lamb who gave his blood as the Passover from the curse of death. And then Holy Spirit comes on the Pentecost because Pentecost had, that, that Holy Spirit's coming had something to do with harvest. Harvest of souls. Didn't we read even in the passage today that 3,000 souls were harvested? Spiritually speaking. And Jesus already talked about uh, people coming to him, coming to Christ as a spiritual harvest, didn't he? For example, woman at the well in, in, in Samaria. Jesus saw her bringing all these people from the town. And Jesus said, look, look, the field is white for harvest. Look at all those people. So Pentecost has something to do with harvest. God was now ingathering the people unto himself. The church was now happening from all areas, all corners of the world. Um, I'm sort of going out of sequence, so hopefully I could say everything in an efficient manner. I may miss some, but let's not worry about that too much. The important thing about this speaking in tongue sign is not that it is some kind of ecstatic utterance that a lot of Pentecostals today call tongues. People speak in tongues today, which is a lot of it is a repetition of certain kind of utterance. It's not a known language. It's not something people can understand. They are in this ecstatic stage where they are involuntarily, well, I, I guess afterwards you could kind of voluntarily do it too, but you, you do some kind of utterance and Paul actually says to the Corinthian church that practice something like that. Paul said, well, that's not a revelation. That's a judgment. Why? Because nobody understands what you're talking about. 
That's not, that's not the same as the Acts chapter 2 speaking in tongues, because Acts chapter 2 speaking in tongues is not a concealment. It is not hiding. It is not a masking. It is not a judgment. But here is a salvation. Why? People are understanding the things otherwise they could not understand. It's the revealing of the wonders of Christ in the language that they can understand. It's just like translating the Bible into all different known languages so that people will see it and read it and hear it in their heart language. That's, that's the Pentecost event. So Pentecost event is not about some kind of ecstatic utterance that nobody understands. Pentecost event is about bringing the languages not scattered but together. Many different languages, but somehow the same meaning is being transmitted through all these different languages. This is a grand reversal of the Tower of Babel incident. Because when you have Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis, God scatters them by dividing their languages. Why? Because they are together sinning against God. This is God's common grace to scatter the sinners so they cannot add greater sin to it. But here, it's not a dividing of language, but here is bringing together of meaning as all the languages are reached by God's miraculous work through the Holy Spirit. Harvest takes place. Something about the Pentecost event also is that Jesus is exalted. That Jesus is now at the right hand of God. Because Jesus said, when I go, when I go, I will ask of the Father to give the Holy Spirit to you. And I will give you the Holy Spirit. So, promise of Jesus Christ was fulfilled. And when, when Jesus, when, when they received the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they knew, they knew that Jesus is now fully exalted. This Jesus is fully exalted. How do we know this? Uh, chapter 2, verse 33. I'll, I'll just read this. Being therefore, this is Peter's sermon, exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured, this, poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So Peter understood. The Pentecost means that Jesus is now exalted. And it also means this. It also means that the atonement of Jesus actually was effectual. Okay, let me say that again. Jesus did not die in vain. The blood of Jesus actually does cleanse. People are forgiven. Otherwise, how can a holy God come without hesitation in full into the lives, into the beings, into the consciousness, into everything of the sinners. These 120 men and women, they were not perfect people. In fact, they were sinners. They were, they were witnesses of the resurrection, but they were sinners. They sinned against Christ in many ways, against God in many ways. Yet, now because Jesus had shed His blood, and because His blood is fully effective, God, the Holy Spirit, can come. Holy God can come and enter into their lives and stay and dwell with them. This is a good news, isn't it? Now this good news gets spread throughout the world. Pentecost is a day of the explosion of the missions. Now harvest happens and the word is being scattered throughout all parts of the world. This is just the beginning. Praise God that we all are part of this harvest. We are part of this. We are here because we are incorporated with the work of the Holy Spirit into this particular beginning. We're not detached from it. We are part of this beginning by being connected with the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, we are connected to Jesus. God is with the church. Church is not a building again. Church is a community of people who are called out to worship God. We cannot call the name of Jesus without the Holy Spirit. We cannot believe that Jesus is the Lord without the Holy Spirit. None of that is possible without the work of the Holy Spirit. We communicate in 
ways that we understand through the Holy, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes to make us understand the mystery of God through Jesus. Isn't it amazing that, that, that uh, we actually are able to believe what the Scripture teaches us? Not because I'm prideful, but just because I know what a natural mind acts like. I'm kind of amazed that God gives me the faith to believe. And I say, I can't take any credit for this. It's the Holy Spirit who continues to work in our hearts to make us come to agree with the testimony of the apostles in the Bible. Okay, this is how the early church came about, right? And let me just pick out a couple of details from today's passage and talk about the early church and some features, okay? I'm actually just going to talk about two things, and then we're going to have communion. First, the early church had a large-scale conversion, okay? Let me say that again. Early church had a large-scale conversion. Conversion is change of your heart. Conversion is redirecting of your heart. It's a transformation that happens inside of you. Conversion involves repentance and faith, and that's what happened in the early church. Today's passage talks about how 3,000 people were added to this community after Peter preached this message powerfully about the fact that Jesus is that Messiah. We already talked about it. Jesus is the resurrected Lord. He's the Messiah. And people heard it. And guess what people did? Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? I love this. I love what, what just happened here. It says, they heard the message. The word came and they were cut, cut to the heart. This perfectly matches the teachings of the Bible that the Word is the sword of the Holy Spirit. The Word and the Spirit, they always work together. I'll say again, Holy Spirit and God's Word always work together. They're never separated. They're never working independently of one another. It's a little scary for those people who hear the Word but who are hardening their hearts because you might think, well, it didn't do a thing for me. Well, today I heard a, uh, a message about Jesus and it didn't do a thing for me. You know what? That's impossible. It does something to you. Either your heart is opened, either your heart is like the good soil that responds to Christ, or you are hardened. You never remain the same. Check, check, check. Revived. Might need new batteries. But anyway, let's hope that this will carry on today. So, Word of God always works with the Spirit. And Spirit always works with the Word. So you better, you better understand the implication. Open your heart with faith. Lord, speak to me. May the Word come to me with conviction. Right? Here, when they heard the Word... Guess what happened? The Holy Spirit cut into their hearts. It's a spiritual surgery. It's a spiritual surgery. So what happens is that there is a transformation of the heart. Where was I? Where was I? Holy Spirit working with the Word, right? Word and spirits. So when the Word was heard, the Spirit cut into their hearts and their hearts were transformed by this spiritual surgery. And their response is what? Their response is, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? That sounds like the noise of the heart unsettled by the work of this surgery Holy Spirit is doing. The heart being turned around. Their values are turned around. Their thoughts are being reshaped. Their minds are being reshaped. It's amazing. What shall we do? They say. How can, I, how, can I, how can I change? And Peter says, 
Well, what you need is a forgiveness of sins, he says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Forgiveness of your, your sins is the direction. What, what does that mean? Well, forgiveness of your sin is a change of direction. It's, it's, it's sin is associated with this generation, the crook generation, the generation under the power of the devil. And sin, you are fully immersed in this, and without life that the Spirit gives you, you are simply drifting away in the way of sin. It's like a flood water just carrying down all kinds of trash, right, into this, this huge flow of water. The world, this crooked generation, Peter says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. This generation, godless generation, people were saying, I am, I am the Lord. I am God. There's no God other than me. People who are living to please their bellies. People that are just pursuing pleasure and comfort just as a fulfillment of their animal instincts. People that are simply living out without purpose like other beasts. Loss of humanity. Becoming beastly. Becoming mechanical machines. Becoming performers. Heartless, loveless, without respect, without humility, passivity, life simply drifting away, right? Not like a living salmon trying to go against the current, but simply drifting away because you're dead. In this crooked generation, save yourself. How do you do it? You need to be saved. You need to be forgiven. You need to be taken out of this sin. You need to be washed out of this sin. You need to be taken out of this sin. Forgiveness is like that. It's not a passive, some kind of, God cleanse me. Okay, here I am. Just give me some spiritual shower. I'm forgiven. Forgiveness, yes, has a has a direction has, has that that idea of washing but it's a lot more than that because sin is not a thing sin is not some kind of dirt sin is a moral issue it's the orientation of your heart sin is something much deeper than just things you accumulate sin is something that sticks to your soul and grows you need to be saved out of this contagious sin. You need to be saved out of this hopeless repetition without any transformation. You need to be saved out of this. How do you do it? How do you do it? Peter says, well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Repentance and baptism. Repentance and baptism. And I, I, I say, these two are not really separate things, okay? Listen to me. Baptism is something you only get once in your life. Once in your life. We don't baptize people twice. We're not an Anabaptist. We're not really like a Baptist who likes to rebaptize people if they think that they were baptized wrong. We, we don't rebaptize people. Even if you may come from a, a Roman Catholic background, as long as you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we don't rebaptize you. We just reorient you. We reconfirm you of that baptism. Baptism is an outward sign. It's not enough to have just the outward sign. You need an inward change. So, baptism is once in your life. But... Repentance is what goes on as a matching to baptism. Baptism is a washing and a reorientation and dying to old self and living to Christ. You are dying on the cross and you are being raised up again with Jesus. That's what baptism is. But on the other hand, what goes on inside of you as the inner change, we call it repentance. Turning around of your mind. Turning around of your mind. It happens not just once, but it's a constant, constant thing. It, it's a repetitious thing. You need to repent all the time. You need to realign yourself all the time. You need to reclaim the meaning of baptism continuously. Repent and be baptized. Repentance and baptism. You know, as I studied through the uh, book of Acts, I was quite surprised that baptism plays a very prominent part 
You know, sometimes we think baptism is just an external thing. We don't really think that's a big deal, but it is definitely a sign. It's a sign and a seal of the change that goes in inside. And it's, it's used as a way of bringing a, a visible sign to this internal change. So, baptism is a seal of repentance, and we see it repeatedly. Whenever there's some new major work opening up, you see baptism. For example, in the passage today, we have baptism of the Jerusalem church, 3,000 of them. And in chapter 8, when Philip goes to preach the gospel to Samaria, there is a large-scale repentance work there too, and the people of Samaria are baptized. And then there is a eunuch from Ethiopia who represents a work that's going towards the African continent, and there is that baptism there in chapter 8 at the end. Cornelius, who represents the, the Hellenist or the Romans, when he repents, there's baptism of him and the entire family. Paul's baptism is very significant too, because Paul was a Jew all the time. He was a very devout, pious Jew. But when he meets the resurrected Jesus, Ananias comes to him and he's baptized. Chapter 9 of Acts. When God calls Paul and Silas to enter into the European soil for the first time, there also, Lydia, uh, Lydia's family, and also uh, the Philippian jailer, all those people and their family members are baptized. Very interesting. Baptism associated with opening a new life, opening a new door. Something new is happening, and people are baptized. You know, those of you who are baptized, I hope that's most of you, thank God, I want you to think back seriously of, of your baptism. That's the day when your identity was sealed with Jesus Christ. But that's not enough. It's not enough to say, well, I'm baptized. It's so much more important for you to always associate that baptism with your daily repentance. Turning away from the sin and turning to God in Christ. Okay, second sign. Second thing that happened in this early church is very, very, very interesting. Because you see that this conversion wasn't just a hidden conversion. It wasn't like, oh, I secretly become a Christian. There's something that happened as a community. And I may, I, let, let me call this, they were converted to the last day lifestyle. They were converted to if I may use the hard word again, eschatological life. Eschatological comes from the word eschaton, which means the last things. These people were converted, and, and as, as a result of conversion, what happens? Their orientation changes. Their concern, their, their, their mind's uh, occupation change. They, they are changed from focusing on this crook generation to the coming generation. They're focused on the, uh, they were focused on the life of the bios, a life of the flesh, life of simply a biological survival. Now it turns into a new life of resurrection of Jesus. Something major happens, something major, some big change takes place here. And that change is displayed this way. I, I want you to look at this with me. Verse 44. And among other things, well, they, they, they prayed together regularly at the temple, which was very consistent to the pious Jewish people then, praying three times a day. They were breaking bread and, 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 and eating together and having fellowship. They were under the teachings of the apostles. And one other thing that happens, verse 44 and 45 and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. I mean, I heard people look at this and say, hey, the politics of com communism or socialism began right here. 
is, isn't this, isn't this a proto-communist? All the people sell what they have and they have everything in common and they distribute as needed. Um, I used to think so too. I, I looked at that and said, wow, that's a pretty radical thing to do. And, and it's a political program. It's some kind of a social program where everybody just shares the property together and they distribute as needed to everyone, whether they work or not. And uh, I changed my mind. I don't think this is a political program. I don't think this is a proto-communism. I don't think this is a propaganda Before for social... the resurrection of themselves. But they are fully anticipating of the resurrection. The last day was already ushered in. It already started. It wasn't fully there yet. But they fully anticipated it to come to the full. Last day already started. That's what they were thinking. They're saying, look, what is this life? This life is like a journey. It's like traveling. They all believe this. They said, well, what we need is that, that final home. What is the final home? It's when God's plan of redemption gets completely accomplished. The resurrection and the glory of all God's people. We're, we're getting there. We're, we're going to that direction. And they're thinking the time is now. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And we already, through baptism, in theory, we are united with Jesus, not only in his death, but also in his baptism. We are already in the last days. That's what they're thinking. And they're no longer attached to the things of this world. They're no longer obsessed with things that keeps them going here. They can become free and detached. It's something like this. I, 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 I try to think about what that mentality would be, would be like. Well, um, I travel quite a bit. I travel quite a bit. And uh, when I travel, uh, there are certain things that are essential for my traveling. Um, I am a light packer. Uh, which means I rarely check in my bags. It's always carry on. I could be gone for a month, uh, and all I have is one carry-on bag, well, beside my book bag. We somehow managed to do it. My wife does the same thing. It's amazing. She's a woman. I'm a man. I figure that she would have a lot more, but she's a light packer too. So we have very light traveling manner way of traveling. But we need certain things. For example, one thing that I always carry in my traveling bag are uh, a handful of those travel size toothpaste. I like my toothpaste to taste consistent. <laughs> so I don't like going to this new place and get some kind of strange toothpaste like ginseng toothpaste or something like that. <laughs> so I, I, I take these little Colgate packs, right? Little ones. You know what I mean, little ones. And then um, I need coffee, so I get grounded coffee in a plastic bag with a little dripping thing. So I have that. Um, depends on where I'm going. I'm also packing a few cup noodles, little hot, spicy cup noodles. Uh, and this, this really gives away that I'm Korean. Sometimes I carry those uh, red pepper paste little tube thing that sometimes the airlines give away. So if you look at my, my travel case, briefcase or, or luggage, you open up and it's still there. I, I never unpack, so it's all there. Only take out things that well, occasionally I have to take out. So you will have all those things there. And, and when you are just beginning to travel, those things seem very precious to you. Why? You need them for traveling. You know, just emergency. Okay? So I need these things, but almost at the end of my travel, when I know that I'm almost home, when I'm almost done with my traveling, my mindset changes. 
I look around the people that I'm with, and if they say, you know what, I could use some toothpaste, I give them away. Well, you know what, this, this, this cup noodle, cup ramen, I had it for a, a couple weeks in my luggage. I don't think I really need it. You could have it. This, this, this hot pepper paste, you could keep it. You could use it. I could give them away, not feeling like, boy, I'm, I'm losing my property here. I'm, I'm letting go some of the, the major investments I made into my life. No. At that point, what are you doing? You are giving them away, thinking what? When I go home, I have plenty of these. I don't need them. So the early church in Jerusalem figured it out. What did they figure out? Well, they are in the last days. That they figured out that resurrection glory is just at the door. And they said, well, you know what? I don't need to hold on to my things in my traveling. Because I'm almost home. And this is my home. When the church came together. Uh, I hope you understand what I just said. That makes a major difference in the way people lived. I'm going to take it to us and then finish. Um, what are we called to do? Well, we know, we know that God also calls us to be faithful in the life that we have here. Okay, we're not in a Pentecost feast. We're having a regular life where Paul says, if you shall not work, don't eat. And if you remember, if you were here, and if you remember what I said in the midnight service on the 31st of December, from the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, we have a great adver advice about how we need to live this life. Well, make sure that you live your life joyfully. This journey that you have, make sure that you live with a plenty of gratitude in your heart. It also says, well, this life, Christians, you, you, you belong to the other world, but this life, this journey, make sure you have plenty of joy and gratitude and also have a, some kind of edge. Come on, live beautifully. Don't, don't, don't live like uh, bombs. Take shower. Clean up. Show forth that you are always prepared for something bigger and better. The Lord is at hand. And it also talks about how we need to love our spouses. We need to love the people that God brought to us in covenantal relationship. Enjoy that life. Life is short. And then finally it says, what God has given into your hands, do with all your might. Live committed. Live passionate. With these great attitudes that you should have about your life, add that one great new orientation. That is, even though that may be what it is, we know that we are the people of the last days. The center of gravity, the center of the pull, what weighs you down is not here. You're only traveling here. But it's in the resurrection life in Jesus Christ. You belong to the last day. You belong to the eternal glory. You belong to what God is up to for you in Jesus Christ. You know, messages like this may not be easy. In fact, I think it's not, not easy because a lot of it is very different ways of, ways of thinking. But Christianity in the first century, when it was introduced, as you can see, this was revolutionary. People, people made real changes in the way they lived. And let me ask you, brothers and sisters, what worries you today? That you don't have as much as others? What is your concern for your children? 
that they may not be at the best possible places, get the best possible things here on, the earth, on this earth? What worries you? Ailing parents? You know, I think we were somehow taught by the world, this world, okay? You need to work hard to get where everybody wants to get, and there you have enough resource, and you have everything that you would need. So what do you do? You try to get rid of all the worries in life, right? You want to get the most and the best. You want your kids to have the greatest things that world can offer, and you don't want any sick, sickness or disease. You want to cure every possible physical hardship for yourself and for your family, for everybody. But you know that it continues somehow. I am not telling you not to worry about any of that. Remember what we said from Ecclesiastes? Yes, live it out. Be committed. Do the best you can. Be grateful. But don't ever forget, this is a journey. That's not the main point. God has something great for us. And if you really believe it, then I think we can be very different. Oh, what an ordeal. That was a strange preaching session from beginning to now. But anyway, it's a great time for us to take the communion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your love and care. But it's more than love and care. <laughs> it's a reorientation. It's rethinking. It's a conversion of the heart. Lord, let us be honest about our attachment in life. <laughs> what we think we need to do to make ourselves happy what we need to have, where we need to go, what kind of things we need to do. Like every other mundane individual living out to fulfill their hearts, hearts desires. We've been busy pursuing. And today, this morning, we are here on this cold winter day, first day of the new year, to worship you and that worship literally says, we prostrate before you, O God, and say, you are my Lord and King. And you tell us that we are the people of the last days. That this is not what we pursue. This is what we have, and we do the best that we can with it. But we are oriented towards the ultimate purpose for which we are created to live in your glory, to live forever, to live joyfully, to live with a resurrection life. Thank you, Jesus, for going forward as the forerunner of faith. Today, now, Lord, we take the communion. We take the very body and the blood of Jesus to say we belong to him. This is another way, Lord, for us to confess that our baptism is sure, that our repentance is actual. May we be blessed as we come together to take the body and the blood of Jesus as a community of people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.